So welcome back uh, everybody for another webinar organized by Princeton for everyone worldwide. We're very happy to have Sergei Guriev with us today. Hi Sergei, good to see you. So today we will talk about the implications of the sanctions on the Russian economy. And uh, Sergei and I, we agreed that we will start with a, a short moment of silence for all the suffering which is going on right now in Ukraine. So let's have a quiet moment. Thank you. Uh, Sergei uh, is from Sans Po, but he was the chief economist of the European uh, Bank for Reconstruction Development. So it's a World Bank for Eastern Europe. And he was also rector of the New Economic School in Moscow. So he's one of the leading experts on the Russian economy. And he had to essentially flee Russia um, some years back. And uh, so we're very grateful that he's taking the time to illuminate us what's going on in Russia and why, how the sanctions will impact the Russian economy. I would like to give a few opening remarks just about sanctions, but I have to admit I'm not an expert. So I just uh, give you my common thoughts and raise a lot of questions. The first question is, you know, what's about sanctions? What's the objective of sanction? Is it like you want to achieve a policy U-turn or even a change of, in leadership? And whom should you target? Should you target Putin and his friends or the oligarchs? Should you go after London grad, you know, the golden visas and money laundering? Should this be the target? Or you want to target the military elite? And we have a poll question on that. Or you target more the financial market and with it, more generally the people and media and so forth. The second question is, we have a lot of sanctions and experience, but typically it takes very long, a long time uh, to be effective, think about apartheid in South Africa and all this. So the time frame is very long. And then there's the question whether there's some non-linearities in sanctions. So that small sanctions might not be so effective, but if you have large sanctions, it might work very differently, so much more radically. And we haven't really experienced some large sanctions we are seeing now, or we will learn how effective they will be. Uh, so there might be a different experience we might learn from this, but there's an existing literature out there uh, to get some uh, lessons from that. Now, the question is what you want to do with the sanctions. You might want to trigger a financial crisis or a bank run. And sanctions essentially disconnect uh, the foreign country from uh, you know, the financial markets or the real markets, the output markets. And then, for example, you can't convert the ruble into dollars anymore, even though uh, supposedly in, in Russia, you can still convert them into physical dollars. I was told um, there might be bank runs to withdraw the rubles and people might then use the rubles fearing inflation to convert them into goods, which then leads to high inflation. And that might explain why this uh, Russian central bank has actually imposed already or set a high interest rate in order to counter this anticipated inflation. And in general, the one aim could be of this sanction to undermine the confidence in the financial system. And then Russia will fight the other way in order to maintain the confidence in the system. But the sanctions essentially are very targeted to minimize uh, the limits of inflows and make it harder for people to bring resources to Russia. Of course, the countermeasure is to have capital controls where you control what can be outflowing that comes from the other side. So the Putin's team will do that. And the question is, you know, how to the, the, the aim, how to maintain the confidence in the financial system. We will see whether it works or not. And of course, there's how can you get some outflow and uh, people might try to get money out. And what's interesting, if you look at the recent developments, whether, you know, gold or Bitcoin is a more better source to bring money out. So in a sense, you often think of a safe haven or a safe asset the gold could be a safe asset, but because what the West did, it was very, it's very hard for the uh, Central Bank of Russia to actually sell the gold. So they couldn't really use the gold and a safe asset is all lives from retrading that you can actually use it uh, when there's a crisis. And it seems like Bitcoin is more the way to go. Now, perhaps we can learn more how this is. But what's interesting is that if you look at the gold price, which is the yellow line here and compare it with the uh, with, with the blue line, which is Bitcoin price, it's a percentage changes. 
you can see after the innovation, the gold price moved up a little bit, but it is the case that the Bitcoin price moved much more dramatically. Of course, it has a higher volatility more generally, but after people have realized gold is not so useful if you can't really transact on them, uh, the Bitcoin actually took over as a flight to safety asset and it's still up in the air what to do. But more generally, we haven't seen a big cyber warfare uh, yet and cyber attacks. Uh, but what's also striking is that uh, you know Apple Pay and Google Pay was shut down, and you could see when people in Moscow want to use the metro, they couldn't use the Apple and Google Pay anymore. They had to revert back to cash. So in in the big sense, when the war starts, cash is king after all. So we talk a lot about digital cash and you know cash going away, everything moving to digital money. But when it gets really tough, cash comes back and is actually much more robust or resilient in a sense than uh, the digital forms of money. So perhaps we can uh, touch upon on that too. Now in the long run, there might be two outlooks that both look not very, look pretty grim. And I, one can see one outlook is where Russia essentially goes for auto key. So Russia has a huge current account surplus about $200 billion. And they can just uh, go back, reduce exports and have no surplus anymore, but just like the Soviet Union for 70 years, be disconnected from the global economy. Instead of having communism, they have a market economy, a direct market economy, and they decouple from the production process. And the question is how costly and how painful will it be to decouple from the production uh, process, international production. I've just, if you look, for example, in automobile production, and Volkswagen is producing in Russia, and I was told the value added is about 70% in Russia. So 30% comes from abroad, 70s, and then the question is how easily can you replace the 30% to keep production going in Russia itself within the decouple? And you know, what will be the outcome if you go that approach for Ukraine? Will it be occupied like Afghanistan was occupied in the 80s by the Soviet Union? The other long-term outlook is, uh, is that uh, Russia and China cooperate, so China throws a lifeline. And instead of having you know, the, the ruble connected to the dollar, they develop a liquid ruble renminbi market. So then the international transaction for China will be much going through, uh, for Russia will go through China. And there will be, instead of having the ruble and the dollar market, there will be a ruble renminbi market. And then the question is to what extent Chinese banks are willing to do that. And to what extent the US then will sanction the Chinese banks and put them on the SDN list. Uh, when it's saying, okay, we actually, and the US or the West is sanctioning also the Chinese banks and and still will not do it. That's a big question. Both routes are open. Of course, Russia might be threatened by China as well, um, as well. but there's a big role for China. It can play as a big mediator at this stage, uh, play be the power broker or peacemaker in Ukraine. I think it's probably our best hope at this stage. But of course, China is, not happy to approve of breakaway regions and uh, sanction, uh, essentially be happy with uh, independent regions in their own country because they have their own problems at home. But in the long run, you have a resource rich Russia and the former Soviet republics around it, and you have a resource hungry China, and there might be own tensions coming on and all fears coming on, uh, on, on their own. Now, let me just end with the implications for the global economy and the emerging economies. How will this whole now situation evolve for the emerging economies in particular? What are the implications for Turkey, Pakistan, India, and some African countries which are very dependent on oil? They have already experienced huge inflation and are not very stable. This might derail them further. Are we seeing something of a replay of the 1978 Iranian oil supply shock? Uh, will this be uh, dramatic again? And that might then also feed back to the whole global economy and also feed to the advanced economies. Then there's also the question about the former so Soviet republics. Uh, what will be the tensions there? Are they wider so aligned to Russia? Will they be more aligned to Russia and the tensions to China as well? And you know, the West was very much focused on the Baltic states and, uh, and Ukraine, but more or less uh, you know, left the other Soviet republics. Uh, in the Russian uh, um, sphere. But in general, the emerging markets at some point will have a choice between going to the West and China. And that's, you know, the tensions is actually coming uh, much more dramatic. You can see already in Security Council, United Security Council, India was abstaining in the vote 
Of course, India will suffer and other countries will suffer much from the high oil price and that will be uh, much considerations as well. Now, let me go to the poll question Sergi put forward and uh, thank you for submitting your answers. So the first question is who should be targeted with the sanctions, the oligarchs, uh, that's what 28% said, the military elites, 17%, but the majority said we should actually target the financial system. So that's um, uh, 51% and only 4% said we should target the state media. About whether the West should introduce oil and gas embargoes, which is very costly for the West, especially in Europe. And 73%, so almost three fourths of the participants said yes. Only 27% said no. And should the EU offer membership to Ukraine? Uh, yes, admit right away. 18% said this. Yes, start accession negotiations right away. That's 39%. So you know that's almost 60% said yes, and rather immediately or with us with starting negotiations. And about 42% not now. We need structural reforms in Ukraine first and all this, that's 42%. So these are interesting results, uh, what we're seeing here. So we're looking forward to searches. He will give us some background about the Russian economy that we can actually put this in a bigger picture and see how things are playing out. So thanks again, Sergi, it's a pleasure to have you. And we're looking forward to your expertise to gain from your expertise. Thank you very much, Marcos, for inviting me. It's a great honor and pleasure to speak at this uh, webinar. I've uh, participated as a listener in the previous editions, and I can warn you right away that uh, uh, I don't have a rigorous analysis to present. I will show you some numbers and uh, survey some research, but uh, we are in the middle of the storm, and we don't really have a good understanding what's going on, and I hope uh, I'll be able to take Take your question. So um, I, I, I'm very happy to accept this invitation, but I also have to warn you that uh, it's not as scientifically grounded as other pre presentations in this uh, great webinar. Uh, I, as we chatted, as we chatted before, it's also a very special place for me. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not here physically. Uh, we uh, visited uh, Princeton for a year, 18 years ago, and our son was born there. And to, as, as a circle, circle compl completes, he's now 18 years old and he's applying for Princeton. So things, uh, things uh, uh, come back, but this time, unfortunately, not, um, not physically. So I will talk about this sad uh, story. You can see my slides, right, Marcus? Yes, perfect. Uh, about um, about uh, Russian economy. Uh, which is now going through a very difficult period. It's not comparable to human tragedy, which is now uh, happening in Ukraine. And uh, uh, yet uh, one of the things you have to bear in mind is Russian economy was not doing well even before, even before the crisis, before the war. So basically the growth started to slow down right after global financial crisis. And if you compare incomes and GDP today to the last pre-war years, 2013, that's actually one year when Russia was classified as a high income economy, neither before nor after it was. Um, so the growth rate in GDP in those years, even before COVID was below 1% per year, which is of course not sufficient to catch up with uh, uh, neighboring, uh, neighboring countries, catch up with advanced economies. And the projection was it would continue to stagnate because investment climate is not good, corruption is high, uh, commanding heights are dominated by the state or politically connected business people, uh, economies are isolated uh, from the global economy, so we shouldn't be surprised that GDP is not growing. Uh, one other thing which is interesting is that um, even though GDP slowly grew, uh, real incomes of Russian households are still below 2013 levels. So uh, growth in household incomes was actually uh, negative in those years. And uh, uh, that explains in a, in a part why Putin's popularity has come down and why he needs the ge geopolitical adventures. Uh, Marcus mentioned um, current account surplus and deficit. On average in those years, we are talking about capital outflow of 4% of GDP per year, some years much more, some years much less. This is uh, eventually the other side of uh, the current account surplus. Investment climate is bad. Uh, capital is living in Russia. So ruble is cheaper. And therefore, uh, uh, Russian exports are more competitive uh, 
than uh, other other countries' exports. And so we absorb uh, uh, current account surplus. And another thing, which I mentioned already about investment climate, uh, investment is low. Uh, investment to GDP ratio has been stagnating at 20%. And given that GDP is not growing, investment is also not growing. So this is definitely not sufficient to restart growth. So this is kind of the sad part of Russian economy, the stagnation. Um, something that we, uh, with my uh, co-author Alex Savinsky, predicted uh, about 10 years ago that Russian economy will enter in, in 70s scenario, something like uh, Soviet Union's 1970s, 1980s. And uh, sadly, this is exactly what happened before the war. Uh, on the other hand, there is a positive side, a robust macroeconomic framework, uh, balanced budget. Actually, Russia is now the only major economy uh, post-COVID that will have a budget surplus. Well, not anymore, but it was projected before the war that Russian budget will be balanced. Debt is low. Sovereign debt is less than 20% of GDP. Uh, total external debt is low, about 30% of GDP, and uh, currency reserves are bigger than the total external debt, including corporate and bank debt. Uh, there are 40% of GDP. So currency reserves are a big part of the story today because sanctions hit exactly them, and that was completely unexpected and unprecedented uh, for such a big pile of cash to be, uh, to be frozen. Um, Within these currency reserves, there is a Ministry of Finance's uh, currency deposit, uh, which is called uh, National Wellbeing, National Welfare Fund, uh, uh, which accounts for 12% of GDP. This is kind of a rainy day fund uh, built uh, through accumulating oil revenues. Now, in 2014, Russian Central Bank moved to modern inflation targeting, and it works, and it works reasonably well. Uh, in recent year, after COVID or during COVID, Inflation picked up a lot as around the world. And so before the war, inflation was at eight or nine percent, and the uh, policy rate was nine and a half percent. The target is four percent. And if not for the war, I'm pretty confident that inflation would have come down to the target within a year or two. Overall, there is a lot of praise about monetary policy uh, of Russian central bank. Um, there are other issues re regarding prudential regulation, which uh, I'm happy to talk about. But overall, if you think about Russian macroeconomic framework, it's absolutely a textbook, modern macroeconomic framework, framework which work, used to work pretty well, especially if you compare it to an emerging market like Turkey, where the president doesn't believe in macroeconomic orth uh, orthodoxy. And uh, therefore, you had inflation of 40 or 50% official. Anyway, so. Uh, just to show you this pre-war uh, IMF fiscal monitor data, which show you that uh, Russian, Russian uh, budget was projected to be in surplus in years after COVID. And this is not what uh, Europe or US does because they think that it's time to support the economy, but Russian fiscal policy has always been conservative. And, uh, and this is uh, what the Russian finance ministry wanted to do. Now, this is the chart uh, that, that uh, um, uh, shows you the evolution of uh, Russian real incomes. The blue line shows you that there was phenomenal income growth, uh, even during the global financial crisis. Uh, that's when Russia spent some of the rainy day fund to support incomes. But then starting in 2013, incomes started to come down, which creates a lot of unhappiness among the uh, Russian uh, population. So uh, it but is how much is this strike when you price? think about this uh, slow, yeah, sorry, Marcus. The correlation to the oil price must be extremely high. Yeah. Oh, with GDP, yes, of course, of course. Yeah, correlation with GDP and oil price is very fine. Uh, some of the oil revenues are sterilized through this fund, but still there is a very high correlation, of course. Uh, so one of the things which I, I, I would mention is especially scary uh, comparison with uh, other emerging markets. So if you go back to 2013, China had 12% of global GDP, now it has 17%. Russia had 3% of global GDP and now less than two. And uh, India is of course outperforming Russia as well. And so the, the place of Russia in the world is shrinking. And uh, one of the most interesting comparisons uh, is with South Korea. Russia until global financial crisis was growing pretty much like South Korea 11 years earlier. And my wife, uh, Ekaterina Juravsky and myself, we actually wrote a paper why Russia is not South Korea, predicted that in Russia growth will slow down because because 
so all these issues of uh, institutional quality and stuff like that. And uh, that's exactly what happened. But the joke now goes that uh, Putin decided that uh, South Korea is not a good model of development and instead uh, uh, starts, uh, starts creating North Korean institutions. So even that is not, is not uh, that uh, uh, pessimistic. Now, uh, this is a most important statistic that Putin is tracking, which is his approval rating. And um, uh, you see that uh, as growth was slowing down, his approval rating uh, was coming down from 80 to 60%. And uh, that is not surprising because uh, incomes were stagnating, not growing fast, not as fast as the first decade of this, uh, of this century. And then Crimea happened, which brought him up uh, from 60 to 90%. I'm doing research on this stuff, so I'm very happy to talk uh, about how these things are uh, measured, to what extent they represent the public opinion or not. But uh, just this is the statistic which everybody's watching in Russia. There are different versions of those ratings, and I'm happy to talk about that as well. But just this jump was probably so large that even Putin himself doesn't uh, didn't expect. But again, this effect started to fade away. Then in 2018, Putin raised retirement age, despite promising not to do so. The ranking started, started to decline. COVID was also quite costly at some point. But then Putin has done a major tightening of uh, information sphere. Uh, and so it's very hard to criticize, criticize Putin this day. Anyway, so coming back to uh, sanctions. So first and foremost, sanctions started uh, in 2014. And uh, I, until now, there's been quite a few papers usually looking either at the firm level or at the macro level using uh, the uh, VAR analysis. And all these papers by academic economists, by IMF economists, give you a measure, which is the total measure for several years. The total effect on GDP is one percentage point. Now, by Russian standards, it's not that little because average annual growth is one percentage point. But uh, on the other hand, it's not a, a game changer, right? If you think about why Russian economy has stagnated in those 10 years, uh, sanctions are only a small part of the story. Uh, oil price co collapse in 2014 uh, was a much bigger uh, problem. And of course, this uh, issue of institutions that I mentioned, uh, quality of institutions, domination of the state, oligarchs, and so on, that uh, prevented uh, good investment planning and so on. I should also mention counter sanctions because uh, in 2014, Russian government introduced food embargo on, on Western countries, on Europe and US. Uh, for a good measure, I should say, they also sanctioned Norway, which until then did not join anti-Russian sanctions. Uh, they sanctioned Norway because no Norway exported salmon and Putin's friend produced salmon in Russia. So, so they sanctioned Norway just to block uh, san uh, san uh, exports of Norwegian salmon. Uh, and then Norway, after that, introduced sanctions against Russia. So uh, the cost of counter sanctions also is not that high. So there is a paper by two Russian economists which finds that uh, annual loss of consumer surplus is half a percentage point of GDP. And if you look at the deadweight loss, the part that is not appropriated by, by producers and uh, tax revenues uh, in the state, you only find uh, 0.05 percentage points of uh, GDP dead weight loss per year, every year this embargo is in place. So, so pre-war sanctions were important, but in terms of big picture, really, really not, not, uh, not crucial. Now, now we move to sanctions now. These are the ones that uh, Marcus was talking about. So, uh, one of the things which I, I should mention, sanctions were priced in before the war. So one, once Putin started moving the troops in November, December, January, uh, markets already were nervous and ruble lost about 10% of its value. And on top of that ruble denominated stock price lost about 20%. So in total, if you, if you hold the dollar denominated index in dollars, you lose about 30%. And uh, uh, government was preparing for new sanctions and uh, the market and the government were debating if the West will go as far as switching Russia off SWIFT, the banking, uh, the banking communication system. That was supposed to be the uh, strongest sanction that could be realized. But in reality, of course, sanctions went much, much further. So some banks got total blocking sanctions like VTB but not Sberbank. So VTB is a number two bank. Sberbank is a number one bank where half of the Russians have accounts. And um, SWIFT 
uh, SWIFT is cut off for some banks, but not all yet. But there are comprehensive export control sanctions, including technology. And that means no chips from US, no chips from Taiwan, uh, no aircraft parts, no just, not just aircraft selling aircraft to Russia, but also no parts for existing aircraft, which means in three years, in three weeks, sorry, in three weeks, Russian planes will, no, well, no planes in Russia will function except for Russian made planes, which are few and also unreliable. Software, if you have Russian co-authors, uh, that's probably not the biggest problem, but Dropbox will not function very soon. Marcus mentioned uh, Apple, Apple Pay and uh, Google Pay. Maybe Zoom will not function. So all of this is going, to be, is going to be difficult. But most importantly, sanctions against the Russian Central Bank. So Russian Central Bank has those reserves, 40% of GDP, $630 billion, one of the biggest piles of reserves in, in, in the world. And uh, uh, about half of this uh, pile is in Western currencies. Dollars, euros, yen, pounds, Swiss francs. So the 40%, about 40% is gold and yuan. We don't know it exactly because uh, information is only published half a year after, after the fact. Maybe much more is now in gold and, and yuan. But uh, what uh, is important, and Marcus mentioned that, since central bank is under sanctions, it's very hard to sell this gold and very hard to sell this yuan because uh, if you transact with the a sanctioned entity, you can be sanctioned yourself. I'm now in France. We have a very large bank here called BNP Paribas, which broke American sanctions in the past and uh, not, not transacting with Russia, but with Sudan and Iraq, I think, and uh, was imposed a fine of $9 billion. So Chinese banks are acutely aware of, of this. Now, what is going so, to happen? So yeah, can you tell us why this but one bank was excluded? That's because What's special about that bank? Spare right. Bank. So I, I'll talk. About, I'll talk more about that later. But okay. uh, the the current situation is such that they want to re, re, keep carve outs for being able to export oil. So until until we get your audience, Marcos, which voted to introduce oil embargo to run the world, uh, until the oil embargo is in place, somebody has to pay for oil, which is not easy, uh, yes. because already now. Uh, OFAC, American anti sanctions unit within the treasury, actually tells American banks what they can pay and cannot pay for. And oil exports are, is one of those things that is still allowed. And so they need to open the door for some. But there is also an issue that in sanctions, you also want to have a threat. And Sberbank is a huge threat because it's indeed the bank, which is a backbone of the banking system in Russia. And VTB is a big bank, it's number two bank, but uh, uh, it's, not, it's, not, uh, it's not as important. So, so they also didn't question. sanction all banks. They didn't sanction all banks. Yes, go ahead. But the SWIFT is essentially just a messaging system. No? And you can also do it with fax messages. Do you think there's a way to get around that? Or how costly would this be ultimately once you set up a fax communication system? And so then so it's, it's, actually, it's, a, it's actually an interesting, yeah, it's actually an interesting question. So SWIFT, um, uh, SWIFT indeed didn't exist always, as you rightly said, banks use telexes and faxes. Now, Russia after 2014 started to build its own system. And so within Russia, it kind of functions. Outside of Russia, I think if China helps Russia, it will somehow function. But we are not there yet because some banks are not yet cut off SWIFT, mm -hmm. okay? So this is not there yet. But uh, among the sanctions which have already happened, in the long run, I would say the most important things are the full exodus of investors and, and trade partners. So Finland stopped uh, selling alcohol to Russia. Russia can produce its own vodka, but uh, some people just love Finnish vodka. Mm -hmm. IKEA today announced they will close, uh, close um, uh, their stores, which is also a big issue. Visa and MasterCard will exit, and so on and so forth. But what is important, which is less clearly seen is, I mentioned aircraft, but uh, things like chips, microchips, all kinds of intermediate inputs, equipment, all of that means that a lot of Russian businesses will be in huge trouble. They will have to substitute by Chinese and Indian products, but of course, uh, the West is still the biggest technology leader. And now another thing which people don't talk about is a major outflow of human capital. Everybody I know is trying to run away. 
And this is this is pretty scary. I didn't see that in 2014. Uh, there is, by the way, now is a discussion that tomorrow Russia will introduce martial law, which means people who are younger, men who are younger than 45, uh, will not be allowed to leave starting tomorrow. So things like this, of course, uh, encourage people to buy tickets now and run now. So what is the immediate impact? So uh, uh, Marcos was talking about long-term impact and Soviet model or Iranian model. All these things destroy economic growth, and we will see a recession this year. Instead of growth of three or four percent, we'll see uh, right now the the existing forecasts are uh, three and a half percent fall in GDP in 2022. But uh, what is special about these sanctions is they already destroy the financial system um, immediately. So uh, sanctions were introduced. Sanctions, sanctions against central bank were introduced on Saturday. Uh, already on uh, uh, during the weekend, the trading was uh, uh, at uh, crazy rates, and the central bank just didn't open the currency exchange on Monday. And uh, they the markets are still closed. Maybe today or tomorrow, some stock markets will open. But when we think about uh, about what's going on, central bank introduced various capital uh, currency controls. So, for example, if I have money in Russia, I cannot transfer them. To my bank account outside of Russia. If I'm an exporter, I need to bring 80% of my uh, export revenues back and sell them, um, sell them within Russia. And the central bank said, we are sanctioned. We don't have dollars. We don't sell dollars within Russia. So all of that created this uh, weird reality where we don't actually know how, uh, how valuable ruble is. But uh, over-the-counter market suggests that uh, it's 30% cheaper than on Friday, uh, previous Friday. So that's that's where we are right now. I, outside of Russia, stock market can, continues to work. And, um, and you know, stock prices cannot be zero. So Gazprom and Sberbank shares in London are now worth one cent. So because you cannot uh, buy them for zero cents. So it's it's really crazy. Uh, but uh, this, is, this is where we are. You can buy Sberbank for Less than half a year of its its, its annual uh, its annual uh, profit. Now another thing is because of these uh, problems with carve outs, so we still don't know we still don't know uh, how easy it is to uh, pay for oil. People in Moscow tell me that a lot of oil gets delivered, but the payments are delayed, and so some people just don't want to touch Russian oil. We see unprecedented discount of Russian oil euros relative to Brent, so. Things are uh, quite strange, and Can even an sovereign idea? default. Yeah. How much of the is the domestic financial markets are they still working or not? No. And how no. important is the domestic financial market, or is also everything is shut down? If no, I, when, one Russian wants to sell a share to another Russian within Russia, you can do it over the counter in principle, if you have a uh, in, in 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 principle. But essentially, Russia Russia is now completely digital. So I didn't think about this, but I think. Uh, in principle, uh, you can you can sell an, a, a derivative on a on a share. Mm -hmm. I can write you an IOU that I promise you that uh, you'll get the share when I when the markets reopen. So that is that is something that we can legally do, of course. Yeah. And there were all these pictures from bank runs, so people were throwing cash. Uh, is this a problem, or the central bank is ready to have enough cash and restore the ATMs and? And so, any, so, you know... uh, so there are various reports. So uh, some banks say there is only a limited amount you can withdraw. Some banks say we function normally, but you have to wait a few more days. So this is this is where we are. So we are still uh, the picture is still not clear. But people, yes, people try to withdraw cash and try to find dollars and buy dollars because over the counter markets work, of course. And uh, the problem is that official rate of the central bank is different from the over-the-counter market. It's still mm -hmm. not a black market. It's legal to sell and buy dollars. What's illegal is to take them out of the country. And uh, what I wanted to show uh, is, uh, is this uh, CDS value chart. So Russia has beautiful macro framework, as I mentioned. Uh, Russian sovereign debt is low. And yet CDS doubled, doubled uh, in, the, in the last uh, week. So, and uh, this is this is pretty crazy, and uh, it's actually double the price before the hostilities. So before Putin started to move the wars, it was actually four times cheaper uh, than uh, than today. 
And part of that explanation is we don't know whether Russians will be able to pay the debt. And uh, we hear that uh, Americans actually say, yes, you can. So there are carve outs for sovereign debt payments. And Americans are very clear that sanctions at the moment, at the moment, maybe tomorrow things will change. But at the moment, uh, if you're a Western investor who holds Russian debt and you get paid a coupon by your Ministry of Finance of Russia, by your counterpart, uh, there is a special permission to receive this money. So, so this CDS price suggests that maybe markets are afraid of new sanctions. Uh, maybe uh, things will get much worse, but at the moment, uh, we should assume that there will be carve outs for oil payments and uh, debt payments. So I don't expect so sovereign default. So bonds are US dollar denominated or Russian? Yes, 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 yes. And this is so for dollar foreign denominated. Denominated bonds. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. In principle, you can hold the uh, dollar denominated bonds if you're a Russian, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, American sanctions will not hurt you, probably. Mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, but what I'm talking about is, if I'm an American bank holding dollar denominated sovereign bonds, without this carve out, I'm not allowed to receive money from it, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're a sanctioned entity. So, so now there, is, there are these carve outs, and if we don't have new sanctions, we shouldn't expect sovereign default because Oil revenues are sufficient to pay the debt, especially so, so given that- I'm struggling with, why should Russia pay back its debt? It can just say, sorry, we are under sanctions. We don't pay back our debt. And they anyway have a current account surplus. So why do they need to pay it back? Well, uh, Russia Russia doesn't like defaults. It, it creates bad memories, but uh, but the debt is very small. So it's not, it's not going to make a difference. So, and- uh, but in principle, Russia already is talking about nationalizations of foreign assets. So for example, one of the issues that I mentioned, aircraft. So one of the sanctions was that all aircraft are leased to Russian airlines by Irish companies. Irish companies said, sorry, <laughs> uh, no longer. We take those air aircraft back. Russian government said, these aircraft are physically in Russia. We'll probably take them from you. I'm not sure it's finalized, but this is very, very likely. That is not going to save Russia because as I mentioned, this aircraft will not be serviced. So they will stop flying soon. But, uh, but that's where we are. Uh, actually, part of, the, uh, part of the panic in stock market in London is also that Russian government for, forbade foreign investors to sell their Russian assets and take money out of, of, out of the country. So that's going in the direction, in the direction uh, uh, what do you think? You can think about this as a capital control. Yes. So it may be temporary, but uh, this is where we are. So imports will collapse. So current account will be huge and there'll be enough money. Without oil and gas embargo, um, Russian macro will come back to normal. This normal will have a much cheaper ruble. We don't know by how much cheaper. Uh, the quality of technology will be much lower. So growth will be slower. It will be negative this year. And, and uh, we are talking about Soviet stagnation, Soviet decline, probably. Uh, what happens if, uh, if oil embargo is introduced depends on China. Marcus mentioned China. I, I would say the biggest question if China joins or doesn't join oil and gas embargo. If it doesn't join oil and gas embargo, Russia will suffer because China usually loves to pay lower price for Russian oil and gas. We don't know how much less. Uh, these are secret data. But sometimes China discloses its uh, custom statistics and we can figure out that it is actually a sub substantial discount. Uh, but if China joins the embargo, then we are in completely uncharted territory in the sense that um, Russian uh, main source of uh, oil and gas revenue um, of uh, dollars is cut off. And so we don't know, we don't know what's going to happen. I Please expect there'll be something like oil for medicine program because Russia imports a lot of medicine. Half of the medicine is important. And so I think the, uh, uh, the community, the international community will probably, will probably try to help somehow. Yeah, yeah Marcos. Okay. So pretty much Russia is in the hands of China at this point. Uh, does China want to have a weakened Russia or do they want to help them out? Do you have any sense uh, what will be going on there? Because essentially well, I, all technology can come from China as well. So if you need chips, you can get some, you know, probably not the same quality as US or Western chips, but you can get some good quality. Uh, that's, that's absolutely true. And that's exactly the big open question. 
So uh, that, that would be my last slide. Uh, but uh, basically, we don't know what China thinks. China doesn't want a war. As you rightly said, China doesn't want uh, breaking countries' territorial integrity because China loves the idea that Taiwan is part of China and whoever wants independence of Donetsk may tomorrow ask uh, about the independence of Taipei. So, so we don't know what China really thinks. But yes, weakened Russia is fully dependent on, on China. That's, that's for sure. But the open war, destruction of um, a big country in Europe where China has a lot of economic interests, actually the shock to European economy, which may be one percentage point or two percentage point of GDP of Europe, uh, a very important market of China. So we, we are not sure. So uh, if, uh, let if me just China say says that- we are against yeah. the war activities in Ukraine, and we also subsequently, then the only option Russia has to go for autarky, it will be very weakened. And then in the long run, China may get cheap resources from, from Russia. No, it, it might be in their interest to weaken Russia. Uh, yes, that's, that's, that, that's correct. But uh, if there is oil embargo joined by China, um, so, well, China needs oil now. So you rightly said that we don't want uh, the environment in which oil is $150 per barrel. So US will be happy because US is now oil neutral. But China, China, China doesn't like $150. So let me, let me wrap up. Uh, I would just say that it's not just dramatic economic shock. People are also living because freedoms are shrinking every day. And as I said, uh, tomorrow we'll probably see martial law or something like martial law. Today, the main independent, uh, the last independent radio station was closed and the last independent uh, TV channel, well, it's not actually a TV channel, it's an online TV channel, was closed. And uh, we should expect that uh, access to YouTube will be closed very, very soon. So in, in terms of uh, our book, uh, I cannot uh, uh, miss this opportunity to promote our book published by Princeton University Press next month. Um, yes. So it's not just me, it's also you. Um, so uh, in our book, we, dis uh, we discuss spin dictators and peer dictators. And Putin, who was based on spin model, is now moving very quickly into the mass repression and, and fear model. So these are the open questions that uh, I wanted to, uh, to leave on the, on the screen. So one is crypto, Marcus mentioned crypto. So uh, what, I, what I know, I talk to people, I'm not a specialist, but definitely crypto will be enough to circumvent currency controls for individual Russians. So you want to move uh, several thousand dollars, you buy Bitcoin here, your friend has access to your Bitcoin um, wallet uh, in Europe, and so you can move this ten thousand dollars by the way. Uh, it, will it be enough to move ten billion dollars? That's a different question, and I don't, I don't think so. And uh, my friends in the financial industry tell me that's very unlikely that Russia will be able to do that. Now you would ask me why wouldn't Russia ban uh, Bitcoin? Actually, Russia discussed that a couple of weeks ago before the war, and then. Central Bank was in favor of banning Bitcoin for these reasons, while, uh, while everybody else in the government said no. And the simple explanation is every government minister wants to move money cross border, his personal money. So that is probably the best explanation. Okay, China, China we talked about, I think China will provide critical inputs, will provide technology, will provide access to payment system. There is an alternative scenario where China says no, we want to stop this war. If China says we want to stop this war, they can. I'm sure that if Mr. C uh, calls Mr. Putin, Mr. Putin will somehow start negotiations. And now it's something that we discussed, the life without SWIFT. In principle, you can use the Russian substitute, which was built in the last few years. And uh, it's not just fax or paper. It's a, it's a real electronic system. It's just very few, very few banks which have joined the system. There is also Chinese system. Uh, so it's not that bad. And then there is also Russian credit card system called Mir. Mir in Russia uh, has two meanings. One is called world and the other one is called peace. So the world for peace and for the world is the same and they use it for Mir. And of course, it's quite ironic because it's a wartime card and it also is not used in the world because it's used uh, only in Russia. But there are substitutes. And in that sense, I can imagine life without SWIFT. It's just going to be... 
uh, going to be uh, very isolated Antarctic land. So let me stop here. I, I took a, a lot of time, but I also answered some questions by Mark. So the David Wilcox would like to know, you know, what you see it, can you discuss a little bit the self-censoring by, uh, by the Russians so that they might actually decide uh, not to export gas anymore, just to keep the gas price very high and also hurt, create a global financial crisis or a global crisis for the rest of the world. Uh, do you so have a this, is, this is possible. Yeah, this is possible. And, and uh, Europe is actually preparing for this. Uh, now there are discussions in Europe, can Europe survive in the next winter without 50% of Russian gas or 100% of Russian gas? And these scenarios necessarily involve uh, restarting some coal, necessarily involved uh, a lot more nuclear, of course. So these are not pleasant scenarios. And uh, th these scenarios also involve very high electricity prices. So there should be a big fiscal support to households. Right? So all of that is not pleasant. We uh, saw reduced supplies by Gazprom this winter, even before the war. And so Gazprom said, we, we respect long-term contracts but we don't sell on spot market. Even though the spot market prices were very high and every profit making company, profit maximizing company uh, would uh, sell in the spot market, Gazprom didn't want to do that, which uh, suggests that there are some suspicious um, uh, political reasons behind this de decision. But uh, in principle, so far, we don't see that, but this is possible. This is, this is possible. But I would think that Russia first and foremost will nationalize stuff. That will be the first counter sanction. Okay, and uh, you don't have a take how long it will take the rest of the world to scale up its gas and oil production, like uh, fracking in the US or Saudi Arabia expanding. To so, uh, to Saudi gas. Arabia has uh, extra two or three uh, uh, million barrels per day, uh, which is not enough to substitute Russia fully. Um, so, uh, Russian gas, um, Russian gas exports are actually much smaller than Russian oil exports. Mm -hmm. So uh, for Russia, oil and oil products are much more important, two or three times more important depends uh, on a day when uh, depends on the price uh, of the day are more important than gas exports. But uh, so Saudi Arabia can can do more. Uh, if oil price stays at 100, fracking will expand really, really quickly. That's for sure but uh, it's not, not yet enough. So we'll see prices above $100. If Russia is out of the market, prices will remain uh, very high for a while. And in terms of gas, Europe needs gas. And so this gas will have to be rerouted from Asia, LNG from Asia, some from the US. So it's not going, none of that is going to be easy. That was told, you know, in the next few weeks, it's very decisive who is in charge. Is it more the economics team or more the security minded team? Do you have a sense on this? You know, who will be pulling the shots essentially within Russia? People who are more economically minded or people who are more, much more security focused? There is, a, there is no question about this. Uh, the country is now run by security people. Economics people are told you need to minimize the damage. It's very clear that economics people had no clue that the war would start. The worst scenario that we were preparing for was recognition of independent Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republic and they were preparing for the swift kind of sanctions at most and uh, that's why reserves are so large uh, russia thought that uh, reserves would de de defend russia but uh, yes that that was destroyed that the premise was destroyed but uh, that's th there is no doubt about this but uh, economics team is competent and they will be able to minimize the damage and as i said um, i have I, I, I don't like Mr. Putin, and I, I think he is a war criminal, but uh, if we want some dose of realism, right now, it doesn't look like the current level of sanctions will result in a macroeconomic collapse. It will result in a recession, quality of life will be very low, a lot of people will be unhappy, some businesses will just disappear, but uh, it's not going to be 1991 with this level of the sanctions. Now, um, new sanctions may come, but if they don't come, I think uh, Russian macroeconomic team will regroup and in a few weeks, we'll see much weaker ruble. Maybe some currency controls will stay. Maybe some capital controls will stay. But uh, if Russia gets paid 
for oil and gas, there'll be an, even no sovereign default. And, uh, and, and so on. So Sebastian Hohmann would like to know if you could design the sanctions, how would you design them? And you know, what would be your target uh, in a sense? Is there, are the oligarchs influential? So if you target them, can they pressure uh, the government somehow to go in a certain direction or it's hopeless or you have to go through making sure that the general population is somehow affected and hence they're through it like a democracy that would put pressure on the government what will be your strategy in order whom you know you have to hurt in order to make sure that there is some impact and of course going off the families of putin friends and all this is one way to go but how would you design it and make it more effective so i i should say that uh, this question was asked within russia since 2014 and russian government got prepared quite a bit for mm -hmm whatever the West is trying to do right now. And the sanctions on the central bank were very powerful and unexpected, but regarding the rest, uh, the government was trying to prepare itself. So one of this is indeed the, the destroying the link between unhappy population and policy change. In democracy, if population is unhappy, the leadership has to choose behavior, change behavior, sorry. In Russia, in Russia independent media, independent politics have all been suppressed in recent years, especially the last year, actually. Um, the opposition leader is in jail for a year now, Alexei Navalny. His team is all, almost fully is out of the country. Those who remain are also in jail. Um, independent media, as I, I mentioned, are shut down. So people will be unhappy, but that doesn't mean that Putin will change immediately. Uh, oligarchs also have little impact, uh, but uh, all these things add up. All these things add up in the sense that uh, if business elites are unhappy, if public is unhappy, uh, there'll be less and less money in the system and Putin will have to pay money to the soldiers and policemen to keep the population uh, uh, in, in, at home. So all these things add up for sure. It's just uh, for now, whatever you do with the sanctions, I think, I think oil embargo joined by China can be a game changer. Without that, I see that it's a huge economic shock. And as I mentioned, one of the forecasts actually gives you minus 20% quarterly GDP in the second quarter. So that's a lot, but uh, it's, still not a, it's still not a macroeconomic meltdown. So you mentioned the oil embargo would be a big hit for you know, France, Germany, Europeans, and, and also the US, and we should soften it by having some uh, fiscal expansion but what's about the emerging economy, India, Pakistan, Turkey? What should we do with, with them? So let's suppose you and the World Bank or the IMF, uh, what would be your description to prepare uh, these countries, the emerging economies for some oil embargo? What, what measures? Well, this is, this? this is exactly the reason they will not want to join oil embargo. And so gas and oil, as you know, are very different. Gas, especially pipeline gas, you only sell where the pipeline pipelines are, but oil is completely fungible. And so you need the whole world to join oil embargo. And uh, neither China nor India have the interest to do that. And so the question is if the West will be able to convince China and India to do that. But yes, you, uh, you need to provide uh, emergency fiscal assistance by IMF to help those countries because these countries are already hit by COVID. And as you know, unlike the advanced economies, they don't have that capacity. So for them, it's, it's, it's much, much, much harder to handle shocks like this. So yeah, that's for sure. You mentioned the uh, oil price of 150. You remember that oil price was 137 briefly in 2008, and then it collapsed. We don't know how the world functions with this, with this price. 100 and 110, we observed for quite a few years before 2014. So, but uh, this is the price today. And so if we have oil embargo, the price is likely to be 150 like it mentioned. So. But do, there are also some winners from this uh, high oil price, in a sense. Is there any way, I yeah. mean, if we are a global planner, we would have a global tax on the winners. So if there's windfall gains and distributed to the losers. Uh, yeah, some of the winners, so you already tried to tax something like uh, Russia, Russia. Russia is also a winner from that, in a sense. I understand, but Russia will be taxed, but uh, there are other winners like Saudi Arabia. Yeah. They might be yeah. willing yeah. to force to yeah. help out yeah. the rest of the world because it's not in their interest either that the world economy collapses. In exactly, exactly. 
No, I think I think if oil price stays very high, there'll be no spare capacity. All capacity will be used, and of course, U.S. will try to convince its Middle Eastern allies to use all the oil capacity. And strategic petroleum reserves are being used right now, as you as you know. So, yeah, people are worried about this a lot. So let me. I know that you have a YouTube channel in Russian, which I don't understand, uh, which is all about after Putin. So, given the events which occurred now, do you think? If ever Putin were to resign or would be removed, would Russia look very differently? So if, let's suppose if we go to the autarky uh, scenario, I think it seems like Russia might be very poor and will be not uh, any major player anywhere in the future. Or if even if it goes in the China life saving uh, scenario, in both scenarios, Russia will in the long run be diminished. And this was anyway before already the case. Now it will be speeding it the whole thing up. Or do you see like Putin, a great Russia, Nova Russia, which he outlined in his speech, uh, like what Hitler wrote, Mein Kampf, you know, outlined his vision. I think uh, Putin did the same thing. And I, I was told like you can download the speech from the Kremlin website uh, to read. That's correct. Speech. It's it's actually quite striking to what extent uh, Putin follows Hitler's guidebook it's it's pretty scary in a sense and one of the things on, on the emotional level I actually uh, used to live in Kiev I have many friends in Kiev but not just people in Kiev but throughout Soviet Union all the song about uh, 1941 when uh, Germany bombed Kiev on the very first day and so the song goes uh, on June 22nd at 4 a.m Kiev was bombed we were told the war has started and uh, this is exactly what happened on February 24th Right, and so uh, and so these parallels are huge, and so I think this is also what drives for people in the U.S. People probably don't don't appreciate that people in Europe see that as 1938 or 1939, and that's why the reaction is so strong, at least in Europe. So uh, talking uh, talking about post-Putin Russia, we don't know whether post-Putin Russia will be nicer or or not, but. Uh, Overall, we know that democratization is progressing. Yes, it comes in waves. Today we are in democratic stagnation or, or recession, but the history so far is marching in one direction. Maybe China will change everything. Maybe China will build a new uh, nice autocratic uh, universe and uh, decouple from the rest of the world and will have clients like Russia. But so far, the history is very straightforward. Since the last 200 years, we've, we've had uh, the size of democratic world increasing and the size of autocratic world shrinking. And uh, it comes in waves. This wave uh, is not there yet, but who knows? So I'm not, I'm, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not very pessimistic about future of Russia. Russia is a very European country. Uh, mentally, Russia is a very educated country. Maybe a lot of educated people will leave uh, maybe a lot of pro-European Russians will leave, but at the moment things are, uh, uh, Russia is too modern to be, um, to be a, a crony dictatorship for 20 more years. But I may be mistaken. Venezuela shows us that even when you lose half of GDP and 20% of population, you can still run your country as a 20th century style dictatorship. So we have the tradition to and each webinar on a positive note, because you made this uh, very negative prediction. Is there any positive light? Um, if not, I, I will give you a spin. But uh, do you see any positive? Well, I have, I have, I have something positive to say. I have something positive to say, and uh, um, I'm Russian. I'm not Ukrainian. I'm actually not ethnic Russian, but that doesn't matter right now. I'm not Ukrainian. But I have lots of friends in Ukraine, in Ukraine, and Ukrainians are always offended when uh, people don't talk about agency of Ukraine itself. For Ukraine, this is this is uh, what uh, historian Tim Snyder would call bloodlands. There are plenty of uh, countries between Germany and Russia. It's I guess it's um, uh, for you. It also resonates, and these countries have seen Germany and Russia deciding their future, their their fate, without talking to them. And so Ukraine, like Poland, like Baltic countries, are very worried about this. And this is the, the time when Ukraine actually shows a lot of agency. And um, sorry, uh, you see people fighting. You see Ukrainian president not running away. 
even though he was in physical danger and he still is in physical danger. Yes. But you see that the, the Blitzkrieg, let me use this German word from 1941, did not succeed exactly because Ukrainians were much braver than we thought. And, uh, and I think uh, eventually, if you want an optimistic scenario, it's coming not from sanctions or not only from sanctions. We do need three elements. We need anti-war movement in Russia, which is very hard to organize because people are beaten up and arrested. We need, uh, we need sanctions, but we also need the military victory of Ukraine against the occupation force. And this is something which is not impossible. And if that happens, we'll probably go back to pre-war scenario where Putin will, will keep control over some part of East Ukraine, not clear how big, um, but maybe bigger than pre-war. But the rest of Ukraine will stay, uh, stay independent and indeed may join Europe. And uh, your, your, your audience voted uh, uh, correctly saying that uh, we should offer a candidate status and start negotiations. As you, you mentioned, I, I, uh, I worked in the BRD. I know this process very well. These negotiations actually result in structural reforms. A lot of countries carry out structural reforms exactly in order to join and actually roll back some of those reforms after they join. Uh, so, but that will be the credible way to make Ukraine a competitive, open, honest market economy. And so I think, I think there are optimistic scenarios there, yeah. But uh, of course, Russia has many more soldiers, many more tanks. So we'll see how it plays out. Thanks a lot, uh, Sergey. It was fascinating to hear your perspective and we're hoping that things play out in a positive way ultimately and the suffering will stop soon. Uh, we stay in touch and hope we can, you know, exchange views down the road and hope that things play out well. Thanks. And, Thank you uh, very much, Marcus. Thank you very much, everybody. And hope to see you again next week when we talk about investing in a high inflation environment. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.